This is Bewilderbeasts, an infotainment show dedicated to inspiring curiosity for all ages by investigating the ways animals intersect at humanity. I am not a historian, an ethologist, a researcher, a scientist, a zoologist, a trained audio engineer, or an expert in, well, anything. Y'all, I'm lucky if I can remember to put my clean laundry in the dryer before it gets funky. And while I make every effort to present things as accurately as I can with a fun flair, I'm going to mess up. And that's okay. I hope I've given you a nice place to jump off from on your own adventures into curiosity, or at the very least, I've given you the key to win your next round of trivia. Hello and welcome to Bewilder Beasts. I'm your host, Melissa McHugh McGrath, still recording from the tiniest podcast studio closet outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And today on Bewilder Beasts, we are going to talk about a monkey who killed a king, a skydiving beaver, and one lizard earns the number one slot for largest number two. All right, let's go. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Well, it's morning when I'm recording, but I don't know when you listen to this. That's the magic of the internet and podcasting. You can listen whenever you want. We've got some really fascinating geese. The Canadian geese have been flooding the city. And my favorite part about these geese living in a city is that there are hundreds of them that take up the space in our field, um, not our field, the city's field, by the river, by the Mystic River. And when they want to cross the street instead of flying because they're geese and that would be the easy thing to do, they just strut out into the street and traffic has to stop for, I've seen it for upwards of a half an hour, waiting for these geese to just take their sweet time padding across the street to get over to the other side where the river is instead of taking either the river, which they could swim and go under the highway or, or just, you know, fly because geese but these geese are particularly jerky geese and it does kind of bring me joy to watch them mess up traffic for a while so that's pretty much what we've got going on that's our version of animal planet today we're going to be talking about some really fun flying animals again some unusual flying animals rodents this time and we're going to be talking about one king who well his reign ended rather suddenly, and maybe not in a way that most people would expect kings to end their reign. I really wish I had more to talk about. I really don't. We're still in quarantine. So I hope things are better where you are. And now on with the show. We have talked about flying goats on this podcast in the past, but we have not talked about parachuting land animals, at least not until now. That drought ends today with the Great Beaver Drop of 1948. And if you thought it was because we had a lot of parachutes with nothing to do after World War II, you'd actually be partially correct. This was not advertised as for fun or a spectator sport unlike the Great Whale Fail incident, but it was sold by a wartime narrator in just that 1950s voiceover work to sell this mission to the public to help the beavers help humans, and find a solution for everyone. At least, that was the narrative in the 40s. What really happened is men felt inconvenienced by beavers, so they put them in boxes, found some parachutes, and sent them on their way. There's a metaphor in here somewhere, I'm sure of it. After World War II, people wanted to spread out and have more space, more land, but the beavers called that area their home. And as people moved into new towns, the beavers, who had been there for centuries, started destroying property, chewing everything, and the humans, well, they didn't like it. So, in particular, Idaho needed a plan, a gentle plan that could move the beavers without causing an uproar. They had moved beavers before from wooded areas to wooded areas without any issue to help land conservation. An example of this was in 1939, nine years before the Great Beaver Drop. 
Conservationists needed to sort out how many beavers the land could actually support. Populations in some places were too big. In overpopulated areas, the beavers were doing more harm than good by just damming everything. Literally. They stopped river flows in places, and in others, there were not enough beavers to help with erosion and water needs were not being met. So in 1941, Time magazine reported on five beavers who by themselves stabilized an entire water supply of all places in Salmon, Idaho. The jokes write themselves, kids. These beavers ended up saving the city the cost of a dam. And while those beavers were moved by wheels and not the sky, it's clear the beavers could help the state's ecology. Here's a quote from 1939. With hundreds of arid Idaho acres already reclaimed by silt-catching beaver dams, the Department of Interior experts look forward to using more beavers in Oregon and California. Cost of trapping and transplanting a beaver? $8. Estimated value of one beaver's work? $300. That $8 to transport each beaver in today's money is $149. The $300? It's a little over $5,600 in 2020 money. If you were to rewind back to 1948 and this new booming town, a man in the Idaho Fish and Wildlife Department had this idea to relocate the rodents from areas with too many beavers to places where there weren't enough, but the place that would have the best and greatest impact while moving them far enough away from the town that it wouldn't be a problem for humans would have been a very remote location, a location that was very hard to get to unless you're Bigfoot. They were not Bigfoot. They had also discovered on previous relocation efforts in years leading up to the Great Beaver Drop that keeping beavers away from water for too long is fatal to beavers. Several died on longer journeys, and that was never the intention. Could they use horses or mules? It turns out that these beavers were so stinky and frisky that transport animals wanted only to hoof it away from the beavers. So that was ruled right out. And a side note, if you like perfume, a key ingredient in your fancy scents come from beaver anal glands. Yep, their butt puts the eau in eau de cologne. Eau. It's also used for vanilla flavoring. Mmm, vanilla latte? Don't mind if I... Ew. So with the beavers damming the suburbs in more ways than one, the Fish and Game Department had to think outside of the box, which they did. By drilling holes in real boxes, putting live beavers in those boxes, strapping on a parachute from the war, and chucking them out of an airplane like friends with a Groupon for Jump for the Sky Skydiving Emporium. They tested with one beaver they named Geronimo. And for those who have heard that name but don't know who he was, Geronimo was an Apache leader who resisted anyone and everyone who tried to forcibly relocate native people from their lands. He resisted white colonizing, and while I'm positive in 1948 they named this beaver Geronimo because they thought it was funny, it's not. White folks using native names in a joking manner is not okay or funny at all, and learning about Geronimo, which I did today for this podcast, is something I hope you all do today too. Go and look up this hero for his people, and instead of calling this beaver Geronimo because I really feel icky and like it's insensitive and not funny in doing so, I'm going to call him Newton, as in Newton's Law of Gravity, something this beaver got intimately familiar with. So Newton the beaver was dropped as a proverbial guinea pig from the plane to see if it would work. And while it did work according to KTVB, they did several tests with this poor masticating animal. Newton, you're the hero we don't deserve. After several trials, they went back and gathered the rest of Newton's brethren. All 75 of them boxed him up and shoved him out of a plane. From Sean O'Kane of The Verge writing about this, quote, On one hand, the idea of parachuting beavers is viscerally funny. On the other, there's something wholly unnerving about listening to the wartime narrator cheerily convincing viewers and himself that everything they're seeing is hunky-dory. Here's how they describe the relocation in some of the muskrats. Out they come, 
Field men lift them by their tails. It doesn't bother the muskrats at all. It would seem the tails were put there just for lifting handles. This little fellow doesn't mind the long, unfamiliar trip he has just experienced. That willow twig is what he wanted in the first place. That's part of my diet, he would say. This place is okay. So to end on a good note, the program, well, problematic do again, white people moving into areas that weren't theirs, naming the beaver after a famed historical figure who tried to save his people from colonization, and the motivations for moving this particular group of beavers, not great. But 75 of the 76 beavers survived the drop, and they went immediately to work and created their own little beaver town that no one has ever been able to access. They have done something absolutely incredible. These beavers created a habitat that is now part of the largest protected roadless forest in the lower 48 states. They will never have to deal with people like us again. There hasn't been a beaver drop in a long, long time. Today, people are encouraged to get along with beavers instead of transplanting them via the beaver brigade, like they were in some military operation that they did not sign up for. It's highly unlikely that something like the Great Beaver Drop of 1948 would happen today, but the offspring of those pioneering beavers are likely still living and helping the habitat in the Frank Church Wilderness. Kings, queens, presidents. There is a long history of rulers dying in unfortunate and interesting ways, or discovering things about them long after their death. For instance, King Richard III was killed in battle, but found hundreds of years later under a parking lot in England. Qin Shi Hongdi, emperor of China, was effectively poisoned. His alchemists and chemists thought for sure mercury pills would make him immortal. After eating too many, wouldn't one be too many? It obviously had the opposite effect. It turns out he wasn't immortal. He was very, very, very mortal. And he died. Frederick Barbarossa of Rome drowned while taking a bath in a river in full armor. And he died. Charles II was wrapped in clothes soaked in brandy, which is an alcohol. This is a medicinal device that was used at the time because Charles was so sickly they thought this would help. And maybe it would have. Maybe not. But what didn't help was when his doctor was fumbling for a candle because no electricity yet and whoosh went up in flames. And he died. But only one leader, Alexander of Greece, has been killed by a monkey. Alexander wasn't the king of Greece for very long, and in the two years he was in charge, things were not going well. Here is a very short version of how bad things were. When he took the crown in 1917, it was the saddest crowning of all time. The king, Alexander's dad, just wouldn't give up the throne, but he was getting kicked out of his country, so there wasn't a whole lot that he could do. While accepting the crown, he wasn't even able to have a party or a cake or anything. His parents basically said, here, hold this. Alexander teared up while vowing to abide by Greece's constitution, and then his entire family just bounced. They left under the cover of darkness into exile. Alexander became king, ruled alone, without friends, because they were all in jail or dead. He didn't have a family because they ran away, so they weren't also killed or jailed. Though not everyone accepted it, and he was called the Puppet King, which is so not flattering at all. And his new ministers just called him Son of a Traitor. I mean, I've been called worse, but I'm also not a leader, so suffice it to say he wasn't really off to a very good supportive start. King Alexander married a commoner, which was a huge scandal in 1918. She ended up pregnant, but within a year of marriage, even before meeting his daughter, King Alexander was killed by a macaque. Essentially, King Alexander did what I do every morning, what many of us do, take the dog for a walk. 
fits, a German shepherd soon found himself being bitten by a monkey. The monkey was owned by the steward of the palace's grapevines, which is really only a job that can only exist in these kind of circles. I've gone on many dog walks. I've had interesting things happen on these dog walks, like a couple weeks ago, an empty coconut fell from a tree and hit me in the shoulder in Boston. Coconuts are not indigenous to Boston. My dog has found an entire roasted turkey carcass after Thanksgiving in a median. A raccoon was running off with a pizza box. The police have fished out a dead body from the river behind my apartment. A wild turkey has strutted down the bike lane of my city. A man, dressed as Sasquatch, snow blowing on the sidewalks. And a man riding backwards on a bicycle. He was facing the wrong way, pedaling up a hill in an elf costume. We have seen some things but I have never seen a monkey bite a dog. And after this, I don't think I want to. In the commotion of his dog being attacked by a macaque, Alexander ran over to separate the creatures, which was proving quite difficult. Guys, don't get between fighting animals, y'all. Things go bad. This is why. A second monkey decided to also join the fray. Where did he come from? So this monkey also starts biting the king, getting the royal near the royal jewels, his upper leg, and his torso. Embarrassed that if this got out on the heels of just getting his commoner wife to live with him as she had to live out of the country because people are terrible sometimes, King Alexander didn't want this monkey business to get out into the public. So his staff did the best they could. They cleaned out the very deep wounds in a time before we had antibiotics and just sent him on his way. Later that day, it became clear the bites were way worse than imagined, and they became infected. Shock. He got a fever, he developed sepsis, which is never good, and while the doctors considered amputating his leg, they didn't want to get in trouble if it didn't work. So instead of doing anything at all to help King Alexander, the doctors just pretended he was fine. And by the time they figured out they would do something by amputating his leg, it was too late. The writing was on the wall. The infection had spread through his entire body, and he died 23 days after being bitten by this monkey. So his wife became queen, right? No. Because Greece had to take their eyes off the ball, a war that they were actively fighting in Turkey. In order to sort out who would lead them, Greece lost the war with hundreds of thousands of deaths. According to Winston Churchill, quote, It is perhaps no exaggeration to remark that a quarter of a million persons died of this monkey bite. <laughs> One special little lady breaks the number one record for the largest number two. The curly-tailed lizard, an invasive species brought into Florida to help control the sugarcane pests, and it went about as good as all the other invasive species we have covered on this podcast. Rabbits, cane toads, goats who want to drink your pee, all of them started off as what was thought to be a, quote, good idea, and ended up being a very, very bad idea. The curly-tailed lizard usually eats flowers, plants, insects, and if they get big enough, they might eat other lizards, like anoles. And if you're one particular lizard living near a beachside pizza shop in Florida, you might also have a diet made similarly to those of the frat boys of Florida's beach coast. Let our friend, the curly-tailed lizard, serve as a warning to others. By embracing the bachelor lifestyle right now, or those kids who would make it a national law that everyone is to eat pizza for every meal of every day because things get a bit crappy for our friend, Ms. Lizard. Researchers went out to look for these lizards on purpose to collect samples. They thought, Eureka, we have one, and look, she's pregnant. They took her in, x-rayed her, and realized, yeah, she's not pregnant. 80% of her body mass was impacted poop, giving her the record for the biggest known poo known to humankind. But the sad part is she had to be euthanized. She could not be saved. These lizards are literally eating themselves to death. And 
Let's look at the 80% of body mass. That is a lot of weight. What that means is if you weigh 60 pounds, like an average third grader, 48 pounds of you would be poop, which is the size of my dog. The last 12 pounds would be, well, you. 200 pound adult human male, 40 pounds human, 160 pounds poop. So while the headline, deceptively chunky lizard breaks an unfortunate strange record, is funny on the surface, when you think about it or look at the CT scan of this poor animal, it is clear that this is very problematic indeed. Evolution has conditioned these animals to try to eat literally anything that moves, as they are known to be an adventurous, bold little creature. But when they do what we humans do, move to a touristy beach town to take it easy, it's tempting to just get takeout and not be as active. This can kill them. And while they have been known to jump on moving things like cars and have been documented hitching rides from cars and trucks from Florida all the way to places like Michigan, not exactly the tropical environment conducive for cold-blooded lizards to thrive, and they don't do well with eating human food either, which they have become dependent on. The theory is the pizza grease for this critter and others like her who have been found to have compacted poop up to 40% of their bodies which is still an uncomfortable and painful amount of poop. But the pizza grease from these late night parties left on the side of the road in trash cans tossed on the ground ended up mixing in with sand that these lizards usually can eat and pass because they're catching insects. And that grease acted like a glue binding the sand instead and making a larger and larger ball of impassable poo. Worst band name ever. So kids, if you've learned anything today, it's this. Pizza is delicious, but make sure you also eat your fruits and veggies. Also, if you grow up to work in an industry tasked with curbing pests, do not bring in invasive species to fix a big problem. And third, when in doubt, have a second helping of fiber. So thank you for joining me today on Bewilder Beasts. If there are topics that you would be interested in hearing about on the podcast, know of historical animals who changed the world, animals who help humans, wacky animals in the news, anything about poop, send them in to bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com. Tweet at Bewildered Pod, Bewilder Beast Pod on Facebook and Bewilder Beast on Instagram. And don't forget on Facebook and Instagram, you can direct message. You can also leave a voice text as well if that's easier for you. I am Melissa McHugh McGrath with Mud Stuff Media, co-training director of the New England Dog Training Club, the oldest obedience club in the country, and author of Considerations for the City Dog. Now go get curious. I got today's information from time.com, ripleys.com on skydiving beavers, boisestaterepublicradio.org, TheVerge.com, KTVB.com, Britannica.com on Alexander of Greece, HistoryCollection.com, Esquire.com, Wikipedia.org, Inverse.com, and CDNCUCR.edu, which is UCR, the Center for Bibliographical Studies and Research. Links, as always, are in the description of today's episode. Music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Leibowitz, and interstitial music is by MK2. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, review and share with your curious friends. It really is the best way to help this podcast is by telling a friend. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you next week.